coming up to the summit. And this webinar is a prelim to these two people speaking at the summit. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So let me introduce the both of them. They're from Sanofi. Uh, Elizabeth is a results-driven pharmaceutical quality professional, <clears throat> pardon me, with proven success with leading a centre of excellence for training, communication and quality culture. And Trina has over 30 years' experience in the pharmaceutical industry uh, in areas including learning and development, change management and quality assurance. She joined Sanofi in 2021 as the head of site training at Swiftwater. Pennsylvania, uh, the vaccines manufacturing site. And they're here to talk to us about JI, uh, job instruction, and the success they've had, significant success they've had with the job instruction. So just to get things started, uh, for either of you or both of you to chime in, the labour sourcing model at Swiftwater is to use temporary staff, which many leaders and trainers and people joining this webinar will be familiar with. So tell us please about Swiftwater PA, what you guys do, please, why the labour sourcing model and just confirm what we mean by what is meant by the labour sourcing model. Yeah, so Swiftwater is one of Sanofi vaccines um, production sites. And um, there are several vaccines that we make at the site. Um, specifically, though, for this use case and this resourcing model is um, Northern Hemisphere flu campaign. And on an annual basis, we hire on average around 300 to 350 temporary employees to be quickly onboarded to support some of the early manufacturing process steps of Northern Hemisphere flu. And um, because it's a seasonal campaign, we can't afford to have a bench of staff, right? So the model is to have a flexible sourcing um, approach. That doesn't mean everyone is a temporary worker, but um, about 300 technicians. So we hire 300 temporary production technicians to support us in some of our upstream production steps for Northern Hemisphere flu. Okay, beautiful. So what, um, what sort of work are they doing? What, what's the level of complexity that these 350 need to be taking? So they're doing the early process steps, which is around um, managing eggs, inoculation, and harvesting. So that was the, those are the three process areas that we were very focused on for this and that they're hired for. Okay, managing eggs, just my ignorance. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so our flu vaccine is manufactured, it's an egg production, um, so we use, we inoculate eggs with live oh. um, flu virus to be able to grow and um, purify and, well, extract, harvest and extract and purify to be oh, okay. a um, vaccine. So some of the work they do is a little bit um you know, manual and, and, and very tactical because you have to handle the eggs, you have to process the eggs and um, be able to make sure that the eggs are available for inoculation and harvest. And, you know, then there's cleanup that happens with all of that as well. Yeah, sure. So this, uh, the, the, the bringing in of these 350 staff and that type of work, what sort of challenges has that created? Well, so the number one challenge that we had to solve for was rapid upskilling, right? So yeah. we are a GMP facility, right? So what that means is we had to, we have to adhere to the good manufacturing practices. So all of um, you know all of the work that we do is regulated. So the first you know, five days, there's a standard employee onboarding program that happens. And then at the end of those five days, the production staff is released to the floor. And then that's when they begin going through the on the job training. So all of this is highly regulated. And we must show evidence that each of the operators or the technicians has been adequately qualified to perform every job task they are assigned. Okay, so the pain, <clears throat> the pain that for that that triggered you to go down the track of uh, JI, was a a compliance one, 
was it was that the main driver compliance or the number uh, one driver was um reduction in upskill time so again because it's a large number of people and the way our on the job training was designed it was taking us too long to upskill and um, be able to have the operators and technicians be able to perform these job tasks independently so number one was to reduce upskill time Number right. two was to reduce safety incidents. Number three was to reduce any type of compliance related issues. Okay, in that order. That's great. Yes, and, absolutely. And then we, how did you connect the dots to JI? Was that something that one of you two were aware of or how did that sort of come about? So I'll hand it over to Elizabeth to, to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I was familiar with, I became exposed to the JI methodology at a former company I was employed at. And so when Trina had recognized the the issue that, or brought the issue forward that she was experiencing, um, I thought this, that this would be a great solution and good fit. So then what happened? <laughs> so you had the concept of JI may work here, may help us. How did that then come to life? So then we uh, brought the the methodology in um, to. You might have to jump in. There, I'm Karen, sorry. But, oh, uh, go on. Are you, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm having technical issues. Trina, can you? Can yeah, you... I, I'll I'll answer. So Elizabeth reached out to the content, uh, the cut the contacts that she knew from TWI. We quickly yes. had a consult and yes. really became educated on the process and how to engage. So we brought in TWI and yes. um, basically focused this specifically again to this production area to these process steps. Um, so we partnered with TWI and had them come in and do an assessment, um, which was really very, very helpful because it allowed us to validate our understanding of the challenges that were happening from upskilling. So it was really nice to have an outside in perspective, right, and have an industry expert from this methodology be able to, to kind of validate we shared that assessment with our senior leaders and the management team and basically then collaborated and worked with our partners from TWI on how best to roll this out within the Swiftwater site. We used the Swiftwater site as a pilot for the broader um, manufacturing network that we have. Okay. So just as an aside, we've kind of tested it and, and established the way of working. So, um, you know, we had a really great partnership, um, you know, with, with the folks we were working with and really were able to do some brainstorming on how we can take the program and make it sustainable. So th thank you. That This leads into a question from Evan Stastny. <clears throat> Apologies, Evan, if I didn't pronounce that right. And he submitted the question, what is a good way to get management introduced to TWI without making it seem like a flavor of the week? Yeah, so this is really good. So again, you know, I'm sure a lot of the folks on this webinar are very much manufacturing based. And I think you all know that data is critical, right? So first, um, Elizabeth and I built together a business case, right? And the leadership team came to me and said, hey, please solve for this problem. And after, you know, the assessment and the understanding of how we can leverage this methodology, we, you know, continued to move forward and have routine stakeholder um, management and engagement sessions we provided monthly updates. I leveraged them for escalation as needed and then really reported back the data and the progress that was being made. And that really helped everybody realize that one, this was critical and something we wanted to continue with. Okay. And so then the 350 that, that you have. Yeah, sure. Oh, oh. Go, Elizabeth. Yep. Uh, it may not be working. We a, may have a to... terrible delay. I totally okay, apologize. We... So, That's from a right. global we'll... perspective, we okay. I don't so think this is going to work, okay? Elizabeth. Sorry. So, no, mm, we no, we can't. Not well, not well enough. So, I'll keep going with Trina if that's okay, please. So, um, 
with the 350 that you had, did you get TWI, uh, the JI, going straight off with all 350 or did you start with a smaller group? How did that work the first year, I suppose, the first season? Yeah, so what we did is we identified key subject matter experts who are also qualified trainers. So within the GMPs, we must ensure that everybody that's delivering training is considered qualified and knows how to train. So we yes. can't do this with just anybody. Yes. And we worked with those specific SMEs, brought them through the JI workshop, we also would pull them off the floor, give them laptops and conference room area to work on creating the job instruction breakdowns and um, and deliver them. We okay. also altered um, and added a course. So we partnered with TWI because in the JI training, right, there's a lot about how to write jibs and yes. also how to instruct. We felt like our trainers needed to better understand how to instruct. So we yes. added a focused course just on how to instruct. So first we had a small group, right? 10 or whatever it was, right? That got trained. They created all the jibs. And then we okay. brought in TWI and tried to identify, I want to say it was about 80 trainers, maybe 100 trainers um, across three shifts that learned how to train these new okay. JIs through a how to instruct session. And then when we had first egg in the beginning of production, we had a nice cohort understanding the methodology and the how to instruct approach so that they could then easily ramp everybody up on the floor. So just let me qualify what I think you said, because it's something we do over here. Uh, you don't need the same number of JIB writers as you do deliverers. Correct. Because once the JOBs are written, they're written to a certain extent, exactly. but you do need an ongoing supply of deliverers. So what I understood you to say there is you focused on preparation of the JOBs to start with, with the first group of 10, and then the trainers themselves, you just focused on the delivery part of the of job instruction, the four-step pattern. Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's clever. And so then the first season, did you cover – the, all of the work in the 300, yeah, you know, the first season of this, did yes. you cover all of the work of the 350 people? With that yes, approach? which I don't want to give too much away, right? No, so fair enough. A little bit of a teaser, but the data will be shared at the summit. And then yes. I can tell you how many people we trained and how many modules were completed. But all I can say is it was very successful. Yeah, we've seen the data and I would support that. So Stephen Best has said, has asked, and a question, how did you get started in creating TWI within the company, which you've sort of answered, but he then says, what barriers did you have to overcome? So what were some of the roadblocks? Okay. What are some of the things that popped up and along the way there? Yeah, Elizabeth. So can you hear me any better now or no? Yeah. We can at the moment. Oh, yes, okay. Yes. All right, we'll see if it works. So in terms of getting started, I just want to bring in the global perspective because that's what I represented was – we went through our SMS group or like our lean group, I should say, at the global level. And they they recognized the value of the of the assessment that was done and also the methodology. So that was really important to get that as well as at the local level. And so I'm sorry, can you ask me the um the second part of the question? The second part somebody of the question suggested was... I turn my video off. The uh, second part of the question that Stephen asked was, what barriers did you have to overcome? What were some of the so things the that barriers, got in the way that you had to in, jump in, around? Yeah, so I guess uh, proving that this methodology would really work and that TWI was the vendor to go with was a barrier um, that we were able to overcome based on our experience with um, the methodology, my experience with the methodology and, used, and seeing the success in other companies as well as the assessment that was done because it matched the assessment that and the things that they were saying. I think Trina can talk more to the local level because there are different barriers that she probably came across with people's time and and, uh, and effort to, 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 to off the floor to get into the class. Okay, thanks, Liz. Yeah, yeah Trina, yeah, what were, the lo what were some of the on the floor local things that come up and... Yeah, Picture so the, the biggest night. barrier is getting the resources off the floor to write the jibs uh -huh. and then getting the jibs through the approval process because, one, the folks we were working with 
aren't used to using a laptop or using a computer, right? They don't have computers. So we really learned that in order to expedite the work, we had to schedule four hour blocks of working time and literally pull folks off the floor, give them loaner computers and really kind of facilitate and, you know, a bit more than project manage. I don't want to say micromanage, yes. but it required a lot more oversight. Yes. So I would say, and I mean, anybody that works in manufacturing knows it's very hard to get, you know, anybody free from, from what they're manufacturing. So. And I think you're onto something there because the, I think this, I think though this, initially at least the skill of writing a job instruction breakdown is vastly overlooked it is to me it's the most important part of it if you have a good job instruction breakdown and you know this is touched on in toyota talent um if you have a good job instruction breakdown you're sort of 70 percent of the way there uh to some degree so that that notion you've suggested of focusing on that and and getting through those barriers is critical so Kerry Survey says, and you've touched on it a little bit, uh, has put in a question and she says, how do you manage JIBs in a highly controlled environment, yep. which I'm sure yours is. So would yeah. you mind answering that question? Yeah. So all of our documentation must be approved, right? So there is a, there is a standard operating procedure that explains the approval process that we must go through, that explains the... Um, the chain of the documentation. One thing I will say is we are still using paper. We are in the process of moving to an electronic format, which would make this a bit easier. Sure. But um, we have a doc management system where all of these will be housed, right? So it just sits within, so within the GMPs, we have quality management systems. Sure. So our quality management system of documentation is followed for the training documentation. So- okay it's 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 built into the entire operating um similar to a batch record right so you use a batch record when you're creating a product it's yeah, right. there's a whole a chain of custody that's that's part of all of this okay and in the early days when you were writing the jobs um the, my experience is there needs to be flexibility because you write one you go and try it out and you realize you've got to adjust a word or something how did you manage that so that could happen pretty quickly well, so what we did is we tested them out on the floor okay. before Beautiful. we went through signatures, because honestly, that process does take a while because it's all yes. wet signature. So, yes. um, you know, so we've now since expanded the program. And as part of expanding the program, we will go and do Gemba's and do mock training with the jib in the floor. So that's what we've been doing in our filling and formulations areas. Okay, that's very good. Um, well done. So Andrew Murphy has asked, um, what sorts of cultural challenges did you face trying to reach adoption with JI and how did you work through them? Yeah, so I think, and again, so from a global perspective, I think the data and the success of the program helped to manage more of the cultural issues from a global perspective. Plus sure. we found that there are some other sites and some other folks that use this in other areas. So the, the momentum was, was building up. From a local perspective, it was giving everybody time to practice so they felt comfortable with the chunking out and the repetitive nature of how to instruct. That yeah. was probably the hardest barrier for us because what happened is once they were doing it, right, even in the training and these how to instruct sessions, I mean, I learned how to do inoculation operations and I have never worked on a floor. <laughs> the power is there, right? Like you see it happen in front of your eyes. So yes. what happens is each of these folks that went through the training and started to using it just started to advocate for it. And then it snowballs, right? Then it, it becomes there. there it, it makes any of that cultural concern go away. But initially there was resistance. There was resistance to having to follow the checklist the way it was in a very specific order. But again, by the end of whatever that day was, everybody was like, oh my goodness, this works. Like I get it now. People, um, can, do, people can do the work. Exactly. They could do the work and it, and it isn't and as- And they could explain the work. Yeah. And it isn't as challenging as you thought it was. So I probably should have asked this to start with. What were you doing before? You presumably had these 350 coming in in previous flu seasons. So what I should have asked this at the start, I've just realised. 
what were you doing beforehand? So we still had very robust on the job checklists and training, but right. they weren't what I would consider instructionally sound. Right? right. So what so for me, the the jib methodology, right, or the job instruction breakdowns, it's a very solid methodology around it. So we would have on the job training that had a lot of ancillary, unnecessary information or didn't have critical information, such as yeah, the right. reasons why. Right. OK. So there was a system there that allowed them to have a crack, to have a go at it, but it yeah. wasn't um, it wasn't fine tuned for want of a better word. So JI allowed you to fine tune, and and it's interesting that you, you miss you say that about missing uh, missing key bits. The part of Toyota Talent that I always remember is that it, it says in there, and that's really about JI Toyota Talent, that the greatest thing in training is identification and communication of key points. The most important thing is training is the identification identification first and then the communication of key points. So it seems to me that that's what JI really allowed you to focus on. And the why. The why was critically yeah, good. Yeah, because right. the why is really what helped us reduce safety incidents. Uh, what locked it in. Right, okay. Sue Whitehead. Hello, Sue. How are you? Um, Sue Whitehead has just asked, how did you convince supervisors and managers to let SMEs come off the floor presumably to help with the JIB writing, I guess. How did that all come about? So really some of this was top down from the site leadership is really <laughs> initially that's what we had to do. Um, we also did it during shutdown, right? So we took advantage of the period of time where we stopped the last Northern Hemisphere and prepped for um, the the next season. So we also did it during during downtime. Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Devon Vossop has made a reference to um, potentially people not, and I, we've certainly struck this resistance, you know, conventional trainers don't like having a reference document with them and a blue card for it, for that matter as well, in some cases. Did you strike that? Um, no, I and think everybody was really very, very appreciative of having it. They It almost turned into their safety net. Like it, it helped uh, to make sure, again, from a compliance perspective, it made it easier. They weren't worried about what they were forgetting or they weren't worried about all the words and the detail that are on that checklist that didn't belong there. So um, that's fantastic. I wish you guys should come over here. We're working with a company at the moment and I keep saying to them, this is your safety net. Follow this pattern and use this reference, the the recipe, the JOB, and it is your safety net. If you do it, you, you won't go wrong. Yeah. But there's a reluctance to to leap into that. I don't know what. Uh, well, I think it's that <clears throat> supervisors feeling that hang on, we should know this work. We should be able to explain it. Uh, if we're supervisors, that's our job. So we shouldn't have to refer to a bit of paper. So, did you meet that at all? No, well, that because reluctant. again, we're GMP, so nothing yeah, right. People should be are used performed from memory. Everything should be performed uh, from an approved document, whether it's an electronic <laughs> document, whether it's something laminated or whatever. So, so yeah, so honestly, it helped us a bit, right? Because yeah, we good. we should never be doing anything from memory. Good. Um, that makes sense. Uh, you're coming from that environment that's sort of prepared for this to some prepared for the discipline is probably that JI needs, which is a good point. Tom Groth has asked how many hours per week or per day did the job trainers lead training? Like when you got going with these 350 um, in a season, how many hours, how many, how many training hours were, were invested yeah. in that? Period? I mean, they're training constantly, everybody. Yeah, so the right. thing is, is that, you know, so we have to follow a specific production process that has its set time. So they're paired up. So for the first 30 days or so, it's constant training on the floor in the beginning of a campaign. Yeah. Um, because of where we are in the campaign and where we are with upskilling folks. Um, so exact hours, again, there's there's data I could share in, in the summit. I don't I don't want to give away no, all the will. good info. No, no. <laughs> we don't we don't want you to either. We want people to be interested enough to come and speak to you guys directly. That would be very good for, for them and for you guys. Um, you did mention earlier about practice. 
uh, what did that practice look like? You know, how did you, you know, you practice the um, the writing and the particularly the delivery? What did that practice look like? The delivery, yeah, so, for example. So one thing that we did very different, and again, you know, I'm just going to throw out Dick Jackson was awesome because he really helped us come up with creative ways. We okay. couldn't do this on the floor because of no. size of production rooms, environmental constraints, whatever it may be. So a lot of the practice had to be mock in a conference room. And we got no. really, really creative um, and allowed a safe environment so that folks were able to practice. Um, brought in props, you know, we pick set examples so that everybody's training the same thing and, you know, so everyone's learning from observing as well as from doing. Yeah, um, so, yeah, so a lot of that was, um, that took a lot of creative thinking. I mean, thankfully, we had an egg cart available in a conference room and we could use golf balls because they weigh the same and, you know. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, you, you didn't use washing. real eggs. You didn't use real eggs from the supermarket. No. I imagined no. you did that, right? No, we okay. were going to, but um, the production staff begged me not to because they're used to smelling eggs and they were kind of happy that they didn't have to oh, be really? around the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Well done. Uh, again, I know what your answer probably to this will be, but Fortune Bolchoz has asked how much did the quality of the product or each uh, improve when you introduced JI. Was there a you've mentioned um, uh, upskilling and safety and compliance? What about quality? Was there an is there an adjustment in quality in, through through uh, from season to season with the so, use of JI? Yeah, so our, our our products our products are always of highest quality, regardless of the training program yeah, that we right. put in place. So please let let's be very clear on that. Um, they're very high quality. Really, the reduction time of the of the of the upskill of the workers came down, but we always ensure we have a quality product, regardless of what if we're using JI or not. That makes sense. So what you understand to be saying there is, is quality is paramount. It's the same. What you are able to do was get to that point more efficiently with the use of JI. Yes. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Well, we've got two or three minutes left, so let's pull it up there um, and just expand very briefly. Uh, just tell us very briefly what you will be talking about at the summit. Obviously, this is the topic, but how? What extra information would we would you be looking to uh, share with us at the summit? Just to give us a one minute overview, please, of what what the content. So the summit, we plan on one, sharing the data around the swift water case study, a little bit more detail around the sustainment model, and then uh, yes. how Elizabeth was able to take this to the broader manufacturing network and turn this into the standard moving forward. And now we have sites across the entire globe working to roll this out and she can share more, right? Because depending upon the audience, you may yes. want to know how do you bring this into an enterprise and pull it through? And then also, um, you know, what are the challenges from a from a local perspective? Yeah, very good, spot on. So I encourage all of you who are listening to consider attending the summit and it's um, much, uh, the, there's some value from these webinars, of course, and thank you very much, Trina and Liz for sharing but more value will be gained from talking them to listening to them direct. And also uh, you can fire as many questions as you like of, to them over the day and a half of the summit in April next year. So please consider attending that. So Skylar, thanks again. Back to you. If there's anything you want to close with, but before you do Trina and Liz, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And looking forward to seeing everybody in April. Yes, exactly. Trina and Elizabeth, thank you so much for your webinar today. Oscar, as always, thank you. Quick reminder, 24 to 48 hours, you will receive a link from me for the recording. Thank you. See you all next all right. time. Bye. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye.